Okay, we're up and up and live on the video. So people watching all the right. video can see all this and they can appreciate the real slat wall that you have in the background. Ah, perfect. Yeah. 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 Not that's not wallpaper, guys. That is that is a real uh slat slate slate wall. So okay, I'm gonna press record on here. Now I'll do my introduction and uh, we're just gonna dive straight into it. Here Let's we go. do it. Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends podcast. Podcast designed to help you feel, see, and think differently about the podiatry profession. With me today is Dr. Colin Dombrowski. He has a PhD in health and rehabilitation science, but for the past 20 years, he's been loving every single day he has at work. He is a Canadian certified podiatrist, and he treats everything from badass Olympians to octogenarians, which I only figured out today when I looked up that word that that is people between the ages of 80 and 89. So if, if anybody else did not know what an octogenarian was, you now know. I had a, I, I guessed that's what it was, right. but I confirmed it with Google. So Cole, how are you go. doing today? I am well, sir. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. This is a uh, long time for listener, first time guest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was good. I'm, I'm glad you do listen to this show because then you know what you're in for as well which is mm -hmm. always helpful. Um, but it lets, me, it lets me realize too, you've heard a lot of the other guests, so you have an idea of the type of information that we like to share mm -hmm. with the people that are listening. And, and I mentioned to you earlier on that one of the reasons I wanted to get you on was because when I had a conversation with uh, Richard Blake and he was saying that as podiatrists, sometimes we have blinkers and we think we can only learn from podiatrists. Whereas physiotherapists, doctors, chiropractors, podiatrists, we're all treating the same problems. We just do it slightly different. And it's a great opportunity to actually learn from each other, not to put blinkers on and think, no, the way that we do it is the only way. And, uh, and as I said before, you are one smart cookie. So I think we're going to learn heaps. Well, and like I said to you earlier, I've been called worse things. So let's dive in and get this done. Okay. So what got you interested in becoming a podiatrist in the first place? And, and wanting to get in this path of treating feet and lower limbs? Well, you know, it came out of um, my own treatment as a patient. So, you know, when I was in my teens, I was racing mountain bikes at a really high level. And I thought that I was going to race professional downhill mountain bike for most of my young adult life. You know, so when I was the age of 16, 17, my grand ambition was to own a Volkswagen Westphalia that was heated by propane so I could live in the parking lot of whatever ski or mountain bike place I was at and off I'd go. And I was on that path, man. I, I raced an expert in downhill mountain biking in Canada for a number of years. And then um, suddenly I had this incredible pain in my hip. And so after seeing all the sports medicine doctors and taking some time off and figuring it out, it wasn't like a little bit of overtraining pain. It was like, I can't walk because of shooting pain down my leg. And it turned out that at the ripe old age of 17, I ended up having avascular necrosis of my left hip, oh. or sorry, my, my right hip. And so they gave me three choices at that point. It was fusion, osteotomy, or replacement. And of course, you know, anybody who knows what they're doing, fusion really isn't an option, yeah. um, you know, certainly. Not, and not at 17. No, no. Um, and replacements at that point, you know, the, the longevity of those just, just weren't working out if I had other options. So I went with an osteotomy. And what that left me with was just under a two inch, so about 3.8 centimeter discrepancy in leg length. And so once I was able to start walking again, I did that, but I was having all kinds of discomfort and pain in my low back. And my neighbor at the time, who ended up uh, having a hand in starting the pedorthic profession in Canada, his name was Howard Fiegel, he was the one that got me back to activity. He put a lift, in, like, a lift on my shoe, we got me in orthotics, we did you know, all the rehab, and it, it was really his guidance that got me back doing everything that I wanted to do. And so at the time he said, well, you know, I mean, you're, you're like tinker with things. And so he let me into his garage lab and I was able to start making shoe lifts. And I, it was, there was one day I was actually in business college at the time. And I just said, I woke up one day and went, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I, yeah. I want to help people the same way that he helped me. So I actually dropped out of business school two months before I was going to graduate. Thought I gave both my parents a heart attack. Oh, I bet you did too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> for real. Yeah. That, you just yeah. seriously, my poor just parents. two more months. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But I had to take some courses to be able to get into this university. And so I I did that and I never looked back. It's been 20 years and I'm blessed that I've never worked a day. I, I just, I love this with everything I've got. And so, you know, once I did my undergrad and my postgraduate degree and became a practicing certified podorthist, I also decided to do just more graduate work. So I started my master's in rehab science with a minor in statistics and then ended up going direct entry PhD after a year of that and started studying the effects of leg length discrepancy. And so I've practiced within sort of sports medicine and orthopedics now for, you know, almost 20 years. And it's just been, just been a wild ride. You know, was there there a reason you chose to be, you chose to become a a podorthist Mm -hmm. and not a podiatrist? Well, simply, so my, because my mentor at the time was a pedorthist, that was the the, the biggest thing that led me down that road. The second thing is that there are no English speaking podiatry schools in Canada. Serious. Serious. Yeah. So I would have had to go into the UK or Australia or the the States or any of that stuff. Um, And and, and didn't want to at that point. So I decided, okay, I'm going to do this. Okay. And when you had that initial surgery, did the surgeons at the time tell you to see a podorthist or this was something you discovered yourself that you had to do or were you yeah the surgeons at the time when we asked the question said oh you know you'll probably have one but it'll be so small that you won't even notice it well three and a half centimeters i noticed that you know pretty pretty significantly and you know much to the surgeon's credit they told me that this surgery could have lasted me for two years or 10 years it's been over 22 years now and i mean my hips still going strong sadly it's in both my hips i need replacements in both of them yeah. but uh i'm just too young yeah i'm 42 i want to keep this going as long as i can and so you know everything 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 at my disposal and in my education i i do to keep myself going every day and did you, uh, did you end up riding bikes again downhill oh yeah bikes? yeah oh yeah yeah i took about 15 years away from downhill bikes and skiing and um in the last few years i've really gotten back to both and uh this year i ended up buying an e downhill mountain bike and so something that's going to help me get up the hills instead of taking the chairlift all the time so i can spend more time going down and yeah. you know <laughs> i'll be honest with you tyson like at this point i have no interest in going to world cup courses and doing nine foot double jumps and all the crazy red bull stuff that you see out there i just want to be able to take my son and do big flowy turns down the hills and just enjoy being outside yeah I, i've only been skiing once and i really enjoyed skiing and, and I, I skied pretty well i just couldn't stop that was my only problem but i said as long okay. as there was a uh, an embankment of snow a tree or a group of small children it was, the only, <laughs> it was the only thing that i found would actually slow me down on a fairly regular basis nice. but i hated getting off the bloody chairlift right because i had like i got really tight calf muscles oh, so, yeah. mm-hmm. which was not good for getting off the chair i would sort of sure. and i'd torn my calf muscles previously a few times Ooh. So every time I get off the chair, I could just feel my calves like they were going to tear and I'd freak out and mm. push myself forward. And then all of a sudden I'd take a um, couple of Japanese people with me who were trying to get me off the chairlift. And then uh, a bit of a laugh watching them try to get me back up. There you go. You know, I know someone that could maybe work with some good orthotics in your ski boots that might help yeah. you with that. <laughs> now that's what I figured out that next time I went, I'd have to take some nice, decent heel lifts in the back of the ski boots to try and just... Uh, Sort of balance it out a little bit more make some but, changes you oh no no what were you gonna say i was gonna say you should see my ski setup i mean you know we, we we use lifts and riser plates and like all kinds of craziness and so um you know to to, to be able to get the, the the height differentials in my skis and so everything like my wakeboard has a lift on it my skis are are built with a custom lift you know everything is done like that because you know it's the only thing that keeps me healthy and functioning Okay, so after you got your initial degree and you started going down towards that path of the PhD, what was it about the research that got you excited? Yeah, because a lot of people will get their initial degree, they may even do a master's and they'll stop there, but you actually took it further Mm -hmm. and wanted to do more research. Why? You know, there was a quote that I've stolen from the very first class and stats that I took on the very first day that I've used in every lecture I've given in every lecture hall across the world where I've been lucky to speak. And it's that half of everything that we're going to be taught in school will be proven to be wrong in 10 years. The question is, your professors just don't know which half. And that was a quote from Dr. Sidney Burwell, who was the dean of medicine at Harvard, um, I think it was back in the 50s or 60s. 
And it was just so true, especially when it relates, when you think about the foot, right? I mean, yeah. when you think about the idea that, you know, subtalar neutral is the only thing that we can think about, but how many irregular feet do you see in your practice that are Ironman triathletes that do half Ironmans, that do full Ironmans, that are MMA fighters, and they have zero problem where you've got people who have very normal looking feet. For those of you who are just listening and not watching, I'm doing air quotes and normal. And, but they're plagued with nothing but pain and problem. And so I wanted to start to help to answer that clinical question elegantly. And, uh, you know, McPoyle's done a fantastic job with soft tissue stress theory, um, you know, in that way. And that's certainly one of the tenets by which we practice, but we just wanted to, to lend our, our spin on the research. Yeah. I think it's a really good point though, that our thinking does change over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's the importance of constantly staying up to date with what's happening i've seen podiatrists you know like i graduated in 88 so it was like a lifetime ago and those people listening to this who i know were not born they were born after 1988 but anyway and i think of some of the people i graduated with and, and there's all, all people that graduated after me and i know they didn't they don't keep up right and i'm thinking if you right. if you're still locked if you've got these blinkers on and you still got the same thinking that you were taught at university and you have not challenged the way that we were taught. Mm -hmm. Things have changed and moved on. I mean, completely changed and moved on. 100%. Yeah. And the, the knowledge translation piece. I mean, we know that the, some of the best research, some of the most cutting edge, innovative stuff can take up to 10 years to reach clinical practice because not all the time are, are researchers, clinicians that want to be able to translate this stuff. They're interested in the basic science of what they're interested in and the clinical stuff isn't always on their radar. I kind of get to span both worlds in that, you know, we see thousands of patients clinically every year yeah. uh, on top of the fact that, you know, we also get to do this, this really, you know, cutting edge research. Yeah. I, I do like the quote that you were saying about 50% because it also, remember a, a marketing guy, I can't remember his name. And he said the same thing about 50% of my marketing works and 50% doesn't. I just wish I knew which 50% it was. Yeah, that's it. And, and sometimes it's even with marketing or running your business, how you did something this year in a couple of years time, it's outdated and just doesn't work. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. That, 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 I mean, we, we could do a whole podcast episode just on that itself. You know, <laughs> there's so much interesting stuff, especially in today's date with online marketing, when it comes to, you know, podiatry and podiatry practices or just medical practices in general, there, there are so many different avenues and ways to test and do, do these things. So with your, so you, you got into the research side of things mm -hmm. and obviously you had a passion for that and, and finding more answers and digging deeper into it. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to work for yourself and not just get a job for somebody else where you could just go, okay, I'll just do the work during the day. And then all my mental energy can go to my research, but you decided to work, set up your own business called soul science. Yeah. You know, my dad, my parents were entrepreneurs and I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. You know, I started my first business at 10. Um, I, I had three businesses before I was 15. You know, I sold mountain bike jewelry. I was a paper boy. I, you know, did snow plowing. And so I kind of realized that after having a couple of low minimum wage jobs in retail and things that I was kind of unemployable uh, yeah. <laughs> after that point and that I really wanted to do my own thing, put my own stamp on it. Can I ask you a question? What is mountain bike jewelry? <laughs> so it was, it was a really <laughs> big at the you time. You can't just throw that out there. I and, know, I know, right. Yeah. Not explain that. It, it was it was taking parts, so using components of a mountain bike. So like literally taking a chain apart, cleaning the component pieces, weaving them into a, a leather cord with beads and things like that, and then selling them to bike shops. And it was a it was a big thing in the '90s in, in mountain bike. And uh, so yeah, we sold those to bike stores and did okay with that. And uh, I you know because we were racing all of us had parts. And so most of my parts came in for free. Yeah. And then I would just spend my nights when I was watching a movie or whatever, cleaning stuff and just assembling things. And these necklaces would sell, you know, wholesale for $20 and, and sell in a store for 40 or 45. And, you know, my, my cost of putting one together were three or $4. So, you okay. know, you, you learn pretty early on what it was like to build something that had margin and, you know, all of, all of that stuff. Uh, and then my dad was um, one of the uh, the directors of Radio Shack in Canada, 
And so uh, early in life, I got to go in with him uh, a lot and listen to how he interacted with his team and, you know, really got those early lessons in business and uh, uh, loved it. And he actually ended up coming to work with me before he passed. And those were just some of the best years. I mean, part of Soul Science, we're a family run business. So, you know, now I think the four of my family work, work with us. Okay, that's cool. So how long after graduating? Did you set up your own business or was it almost automatic? You, you just Pretty much automatically. Work? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> I worked with a, with a group, but it was, you owned your own business kind of within a group of people. And uh, so I did that for a number of years and then decided around 2009 that it was time to go out on my own and did that, started Soul Science and just went from there. I think that's great. And, and mm -hmm. I like and that so, it was sort of it was ingrained into you that you wanted to work for yourself. You just knew Oh, yeah. Because you've like you said, you you started a business degree before you did become a pedorthist. So mm -hmm. you were always, always business minded. hundred percent. Yeah. I but, mean, so I, if, somebody's, I, if somebody's listening to this, there's a question mm -hmm. for you. Somebody's listening to this and they go, oh, that's great. This is why I struggle with my business because I'm not business minded. Do you think mm -hmm. someone who's not business minded can be taught to be business minded? Oh, a hundred percent. It's not something you're born Perfect. with. It's something you learn. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, there's, I mean, there are the, the, the freaks of nature, you know, that are out there, but they're the exceptions. They're not the rule. Business fundamentals can be learned. You know, it, it's, it's just putting the time in, listening to the podcasts, reading the articles, mentoring, hiring a coach, doing the 12 week podiatry reboot, you know, oh, yeah. all of those things. Yeah. Um, good are, are good. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, but it is, it's one of those things that, uh, and I've mentioned it on this podcast. I've mentioned on solo shows and when I had my other podcast, it's no secret mm -hmm. property. And I'd say, sometimes you'll get, look, it could be a business coach or it could be somebody else. And they make it as though they're a bloody genius and mm -hmm. they are just experts. And they, so I did air quotes then too. Um, they make it as though they're geniuses and you must learn from them. Otherwise you will not learn. And, and they make it as though it just was like, uh, it's part of their DNA. It was always just ingrained into them. Mm -hmm. but I think it's, you've got to have the interest there because if you don't have the interest, then you don't, you won't want to learn business, but it doesn't, I don't think it comes naturally for, for many people. They just, no. they might take things up a little bit quicker. And it's mm -hmm. like, um, say playing music. If you do not have any, if you do have no interest in learning to play the guitar, mm -hmm. you're not going to learn how to play the guitar. Someone can give exactly. you one and it'll sit in the corner, which yep. I just want to segue onto something here. You have a goal that I want to mention that you will play on stage and we're putting it out there. So everybody hears this. So this will That's happen it. that you are going to play the guitar on stage with Metallica. Before they finish touring at some point. Yes. You heard that correctly. I really want to play Ender Sandman on stage with Metallica at some point in time in my life. Um, I just think it's one of those bucket list goals that, you know, keep my mind open to new opportunities and new things and different ways of thinking about stuff. And I just think it'd be really cool to do because, I mean, I've, I've always envied them as a band for a certain number of years. And uh, I just think it'd be a lot of fun. I really do. I think it'd be great. It's amazing how many podiatrists play the guitar. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a heap. And my goal when I started playing was I just want to be good enough that I can be, um, I can play at a barbecue in someone's backyard, yeah, and get a few laughs, and I sort yeah. of accomplished that. Yeah, so that's my that's my level. But Perfect. so, and how you came up with that goal? It was challenged to you from a mastermind group that you're part of. Yes, yes. So I belong to this great group of individuals uh, that Jason Gaynard put together in something called Mastermind Talks, and it's just a group of you know, open uh, uh, entrepreneurs that are so growth oriented and growth minded in all kinds of different realms of business, you know, from internet marketers to, you know, people who run brick and mortar businesses to payment companies to, you know, Bitcoin companies, there's all different kinds of things. But the one thing we all have in common is that we're all really open to personal development. And, yeah. you know, I got into this probably six years ago, you know, and, you know, thought a lot of this stuff was woo woo back then. <laughs> and uh, I spent a weekend with uh, Jason Tucker Max and Joey Coleman in a, a personal branding uh, weekend in Las Vegas. And I'll tell you, you know, the, what I really realized at that point was that I struggled with self-worth in a way that was, you know, just not defined to me at that point. And what I came away from that was with a, a firm sense of that I was, I was enough. I was chasing all of these 
external validation things and, and didn't really believe in it myself first. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm telling you, you know, six years later, my business has tripled in size and I'm a better husband and father and entrepreneur and leader and coach and mentor and all of these things, you know, all through being involved in that, in that one group. And so did, it, it did, fundamentally did say, changed my life. Did you say Tucker Max is in? Is that, he's the one that the author of, I hope they serve beer in hell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Friend of mine, Dave Freeze. I don't know if you know who Dave Freeze is. But I him, don't actually. Him and Tucker Max are friends, and Dave's oh, okay. dog is called Tucker Max. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Nice. <laughs> so my, my first book came out through Tucker's company. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So And Jesse Cole's in that group as well, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he is. Yeah. So so uh, Jesse and I are actually part, part of, uh, in a group together too. Yeah. Jesse's fantastic. Oh, isn't he? So anyone listening, Jesse has been on this podcast before. I'm just going to, I'm going to dig up and tell you the episode. Is, I don't know it straight off the top of my head, but I do have it here on my computer. And it was, oh, I can edit this out on the podcast to get it right. Um, oh, I can't remember what it was. I'll put it in the show. Now. Oh, here he is. Jesse Cole, episode 118. And it was Be Successful by Standing Out. And he owns the Savannah, oh, the Savannah Bananas. You've got to say it that mm -hmm. way so it sounds better. If you say yeah. it how we say it, Savannah bana Bananas, it just doesn't sound right. It's not the same. Good. But he is such an inspirational guy. Mm -hmm. yeah so and what's some, neat about that group is that yeah. all of them are like that yeah so you've got some amazing people in that group and yeah i think anybody who is listening to this now if you take nothing else away from this particular talk which i think you'll take away a pile of stuff is you cannot do everything yourself if you're sitting in a silo in your business and you're thinking oh no i don't need any help or i don't need to be in part of mastermind groups you're really missing out on great opportunities Oh, 100%. I couldn't echo that enough. The, the amount of people that you can find that have, you know, aligned interests to yours that you can learn from. I, I'm much like what you said before, in terms of learning from other people, I've, I've been able to learn so much from the theories of just other business people and how they run their stuff, like how they run their stuff. And from learning from physios and podiatrists and chiropodists and orthotists and all, you know, so I'll talk to anybody yeah. and try to figure out what they're doing and see, you know, how, how that helps to get people better at the end of the day. Because, you know, when I was teaching this stuff at the university, the very first question that I would ask people, because I ended up teaching the capstone course, it was the last course that brought everything together to make everything clinically relevant. And here's the question that I would pose to all of my students as their first assignment and say, listen, you know, I can make a device completely differently than the way that you make a device. And in fact, there was a study that came out a number of years ago that found that there were like zero systematic effects of orthotics across multiple practitioners. When they took the same patient to multiple different practitioners, they made them multiple different orthotics, right? Because yeah. there are no gold standards in terms of how you do this. So you've got some people who make a very simple device, some people who make a very bells and whistles, you know, oriented, heavy device. Um, but at the end of the day, patients get better. So if I make a device differently than the way you make a device, but our patient still gets better, is it really the device or is there something more going on that's actually doing it? And how could you look someone in the, in the face and say, my way is better than your way? You know, when, when we're looking into something like this, because there are so many different avenues that we haven't explored, you know, the social uh, you know, aspects of this. I mean, how many people come into you and how long do you get to talk to them compared to the average visit to a, a primary care physician? Yeah. You know, we spend 45 minutes with somebody where they talk about everything and we touch their foot and we get involved intimately in, in, in what's going on in their lives. And you know, is, is that alone allowing them to offload a lot of their stuff? And the psychosocial component of what we do is so incredibly important. Yet, I don't think enough people give, give that credence. And they're saying, well, it's, it's because I gave you a four degree lateral hind foot wedge is why you got better. I don't think it works like that. I think the psychosocial part of it is a huge part of our treatment. The whole psychology of working with patients. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes just you know, when, when somebody will just tell you the problem, they feel better. Yeah. Just by sharing it, mm -hmm. that, that it feels better. And there was something I saw TV just recently, and they were even questioning the usefulness of paracetamol. Okay. In certain problems, it does help. But they reckon other pain problems that it's being marketed for, it does not help at all. It does not reduce the pain. But when people take it, they feel better. 
So straight and away, the, it's the psychology of taking that pill. The, pl- the whole the placebo, placebo effect, it, it is real. It is a real thing. I remember so, I had this patient many, many years ago. She was blind. So mm-hmm. I was making up a simple inner cell for her shoe. So I was you know, cutting out a paper template of a shoe first, and I was putting some marks of feet, getting her to stand up on it, put those marks onto that, and then go and make the insole. Anyway, I'd cut the paper out. I'd put that in her shoes. And she obviously didn't understand what I was talking about. As soon as she stood up on the paper, she went, oh, that feels so much better. Interesting. And there was just a thin piece of paper that I'd put in there just to do the template. Sure. And I said, oh, that's great. Well, when I... I'll be back soon and they'll feel even better. They'll feel even more better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I then quickly went off and made them because it was very simple. Put them in a shoe and she said, oh, yeah, they, they, they feel even better again. Right. But just putting that piece of paper in a shoe, straight away when she stood up, she said her feet felt better. Yeah. Well, and, and it's incredible. For anybody who spent any time adjusting a metatarsal pad, for somebody who has an aroma or you know, intermetatarsal bursitis or any of those things, and you know, you're, you're removing things by a millimeter or two there, tweaking things by a millimeter or two over here. You know, I, I, I have a hard time getting around the fact that, you know, that j- it's just that millimeter that's making all the difference in the world. And so maybe it is, maybe it isn't though. Yeah. And, and that's the part that I'm incredibly interested in. So what, what you're saying is we need to, when we're doing certain things, we need to question what we're doing and just, and don't always just assume the what you think is the most logical reason. There could be other things going on. A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because you, then oh, no, keep going. No, 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 please go ahead. Oh no. I was going to say that you mentioned uh, like Tucker Max being part of your um, mastermind group and you wrote a book through Tucker Max's company. What yes. was the book that you wrote? Oh, it was called the plantar fasciitis plan. And so, uh, you know, half of my day is dealing with plantar fasciitis. And so we, very early on, I I wrote this small manual to give to everybody that had plantar fasciitis here. Basically everything we went through in an appointment, here's all the things that we can do. And so I I formalized that and turned that into a a real book. And so gave people the ability to run through a home-based therapy program that would allow them to feel better and not necessarily have to go through and see somebody like me. Um, where you know, a, a lot of the acute plantar fasciitis stuff can be managed really well from home with the right kind of information. Yeah. And so, you know, as long as your diagnosis is correct and you don't have, you know, you're not diabetic or you have any other of these conditions where, you know, if, if you start messing with stuff, you can really hurt yourself. Um, but there are some simple things that you can do to feel better tomorrow morning, just based on the current literature. So we put that together and put together this whole algorithm of things that you can do right, right to the end of surgery. And then for prevention, strengthening, getting better, all of that stuff is in there. And then we brought in specialists in each part of that. So there are family doctors that wrote sections, massage therapists that wrote sections, physios. Um, we're just about to release version two and there's a nutrition section. Ian Alexander, I'm not sure if you know him. He's a, no. just an epic foot surgeon, wrote the, the foot surgery section. And so, you know, we really pulled a lot of these people in to, to lend their expertise in this book too. And it's, it's been not only helpful from, from people all over the world who I get emails from to say, hey, you know, this book, it changed my life. It's been you know nine months of dealing with this and multiple specialists and no one told me to stretch my feet in the morning, you know, stuff, simple stuff like that. And so that was the first one that we did through, through Tucker, but then also as a lead generation from a business standpoint and from an authority generating side point, you know, that's also done just wonders for the business too, because we can leave it in a, in you know, physician's offices and we can, we do things where people come to it by happenstance and realize, oh, wow, this is, this is a guy that's just down the street from me. So yeah. writing a book to show authority has just been, has been fantastic. Oh, like, um, it's no secret, there's money in podiatry. I've, I've heard that's a good book. <laughs> uh, you've got a copy. That's right. I remember you telling me that you actually I do. I book. just got my copy, actually. Yeah. So here, <laughs> here it is. And so- it's funny because somebody, somebody asked me once, oh, when you write the book, hey, you know, do you make a lot of money writing the book? No. No, it actually costs you a lot of money and time it to does. actually write a yeah. book. Mm-hmm. So there's there's not much money in writing a book, but it does, like you said, it, it, it can build you as an authority in in a particular area. So when I first wrote that book, I remember uh, a friend of mine who'd written, he's got 11 books or 13 books that he's written. Oh, wow. And he said, if people, if someone was tossing up between, say, a business coach, for example, 
Mm. And you've got one here who hasn't written a book and one who has written a book. Yeah. It's not just because they've got the book makes them better, but they can read the book and they get an idea of how you think. Yeah. Because a lot of times how you write is how you speak. A hundred percent. And it's no different to doing a podcast. I know there's people that listen to this podcast that I now do coaching with purely because they've heard me on the podcast and they go, I think I can work with Tyson. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's some that listen to it and go, I like the podcast, Tyson, but there's no way I could actually work with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're just not, they're, they're just not the ones to work with you. You know, no, the they just the don't. Day. Yeah. They don't know what's good for them. Yep. So yep. what's, what's next for you down the track? Well, so you've got a cracking business at the moment, Soul Science. Mm -hmm. It's going mm -hmm. really well. It is. You obviously, you're still doing research. You've got your PhD. Mm -hmm. What is next for you? Where, where do you see yourself taking this um, in the future? You know, right now, it's going to be um, kind of pulling back from the clinical side to really grow the people who work who, who work it in the business. Okay. And so at this point now, it's taking 20 years of experience and, you know, the graduate work and all of the research and everything else. And it's, it's about building up other specialists within within soul science and within the students that we bring on. That's where I see myself going and kind of building the leadership team so that it can go, it, it can triple in size again in the next five, six years. That's really where I see myself going there is to, is to lead the company through our next phase of growth. Um, we're always doing research and we always have things on the go. So there, there will be papers that will come out for sure and opportunities end up presenting themselves at all kinds of, of fun times. Uh, and I definitely see myself getting back to doing a lot more speaking. And so I spoke at a lot of conferences before my children were born. Yeah. And um, so, in, you know, from the Ontario Medical Association to the, you know, PFOLA to PAC to, you know, the ones in the, in the U.S. and, and beyond. And I, I really want to get back to that and, uh, and do a bit more of that because I, I very much enjoy it. So the, the teaching aspect is a lot of fun. Yeah, I think the leadership aspect that you just spoke about then is really, really important. I think there's a lot of business owners that love being the technician. They love being with the patients. Sure. And I think yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. If you want to work five, six days a week just seeing patients and you absolutely love it, then you need to do it. But if you want to grow your business, somebody needs to lead the business. And I don't That's always it. think the business owner has to be the leader of the business either. No, you know, it, it's really about finding what your unique ability is and, yeah. and going with that, right? And then, and then building the, the who's that are going to allow you to do the how's of your business to steal something straight from strategic coach. Um, I believe that's all trademarked by Dan Sullivan. And, ask, ask who, not how. Yeah, exactly. And so to, you know, to that end of it, if, if you love seeing patients every day and don't want to look at KPIs and figure out your marketing strategy, you can hire for that. Mm. You know, I happen to enjoy both. And so I think there's a way that we can, that we can do that where I can be available to help grow our young, our young specialists, our young pedorthists in a way that, you know, when they have questions, we're available to teach, uh, but then also spend our time growing the leadership team to be able to get us to that next step. Yeah. I think that's a really important point that you mentioned. And like I touched on as well, was just, yeah, if you really like treating patients, and you don't like looking at numbers and you you know what, you really don't want to lead a team. Don't feel that you have to do that. Exactly. And I think some people think it's just a progression. You, you know, you go to university, you graduate, you work for somebody else for a couple of years, you set up your own business. And therefore after a number of years, you must employ somebody else. And then you're supposed to lead them and grow the business. And I don't think you have to do that. I think if you're really enjoying your business at a particular size and keep it that way, if you want exactly. to grow it, but you're not a great leader, then find someone who can help you with the whole leadership aspect. Yeah. Yeah. And because, do, do the you parts know, you like. And do the parts that you like. Exactly. Exactly. Because I know some people that are good at marketing. So they like doing the marketing business, but they're just not great leaders. And there's other people who are good leaders and they're not very good at marketing the business. So yeah. it's, it's hard to find someone who's awesome at everything. Right. Yeah. I mean, those jack of all trades are definitely rare when it comes to those, those kinds of things, but you know, it's all about really finding that area where you do your best work, amplifying it. I think it was Tim Ferriss that said, I, I would rather amplify my strengths than spend time trying to, you know, incrementally fix my weaknesses. And so, you know, that's what we'll do. We'll amplify our strengths then, and, and we'll hire for my weaknesses. And, uh, you know, that way we're going to build a, just a fantastic team. Yeah. And I think Henry Ford used to do the same thing that he employed people who were far better than him in so many different areas. 
Right. And that's and that's what grew the and that's what grew the business. Mm-hmm. So before we before we wrap up, if if a podiatrist bumped into you tomorrow, yes, what's just say it's Monday morning, they've gone and grabbed a coffee somewhere, mm-hmm. and they've bumped in. They go, Colin from Soul Science, how are you doing? I heard you on my favorite podcast, uh, the mm-hmm. Podiatry Legends podcast. And what's one tip you would give them as they were heading into work that day? Oh, wow. One tip that I would give them heading into work that day. Um, be open to adjusting your orthotics as much as your patient needs. Oh, okay. Haven't had anyone say that before. Do, do tell us, tell us more. Well, so to that end, you know, orthotics are one of those things where there's no magical X, Y, Z formula that equals the perfect device for somebody. And so at the end of the day, if, if you're wrapped up in the, in the thinking that as long as I do X, Y, and Z, this is going to be correct again in air quotes for your foot and yeah. you just have to get used to it is I, I think a, a line of thinking that can sometimes hurt people. And you'd be, you'd be surprised how many people I've seen who've wound up with fifth metatarsal stress fractures and you know all kinds of interesting issues from orthotics that have not been comfortable, that people have been told, just tough it out and you're gonna be okay, and they're not. So at the end of the day, I think it's, you know try to get your patients as comfortable in their orthotics as they can. Because we both know that, you know, that's really going to help your your retention and your in and for you to be in the repeat business. Okay, what what's your thinking on the philosophy of you must break orthotics in over a period of time? Compared oh, for to sure. Just putting them on and wearing them. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, most definitely, people will need to break into anything that's going to put a new stress on their body over a period of time, for sure. And so, once they've been through that process, though, and if if, if they're two three weeks in and they're still not comfortable and can't wear it for an eight hour shift without a, an increase, a change, or a new or different pain, then yeah. certainly it's time to rethink your 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 approach. Okay, I, I just think it's really good and a good way to finish on. But before we finish, I want to touch on one other thing. Mm-hmm. You, you like smoking brisket. I, yes, I do. Yeah. I'm a big fan of, uh, of backyard barbecue smoking. Yeah. So how long have you been doing that for? Oof. Uh, 10 years. Oh, wow. Okay. It's about 10 years longer than me. And okay. <laughs> I only got my first smoker about, uh, five months ago, five or six months ago. Okay. What'd you get? Uh, I got a pro Q bullet smoker. Okay. Yep. Yep. So, um, I must admit far more difficult than I ever expected it to be. Well, especially in, in one of those kinds of smokers, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said, if you can master that, you can master anything. They said, 100%. The hardest ones to actually do. I'm like, Great. Yep. I went for one of the hardest ones. Yep. Um, and then I did the podcast uh, that just came out. So when people mm-hmm. hear this, they'll go, okay, now I know at what time we did this recording. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the top 10, oh, it wasn't, it was 10 meat smoking tips that apply to your podiatry business. That's it. That's it. That was it. And what's funny is every time I was doing something on the smoker, it made me realize, wow, this is just like doing something in your podiatry clinic. And as I was thinking about it, I went, and I was writing these down, I went, okay, this is, I'm going to do a solo episode on that. And that's sort of how it how it came about. So what's, what's your favorite? Is, is brisket your favorite meat? To smoke? Yeah, brisket's probably my, my favorite thing to put on the smoker for sure. And we've tried it a bunch of different ways and, and you know, tried wrapping it in butcher paper, tried wrapping it in, you know, using tinfoil and, and just all kinds of different ways to come up with the best brisket that we can and, and yeah. you know, diff, different kinds of meat and different sort of different cuts of meat and different kinds of, of wood. And so I started in a barrel smoker too, it was a Weber smokehouse. Okay. And again, it, you know, if you can cook on one of those things, because, you know, you need to tend to that for 13, 14 hours, really, then yeah. you really learn the fundamentals, you know, behind it. And recently I ended up buying a, a Traeger pellet smoker, which okay. is is far more set it, forget it, you close the lid, open it 12 hours later and see see what you got kind of thing. And um, very, very, very different. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't take up your entire day, ter- you know, staring through a small hole, moving around coals and wood and everything else. So, um, there's very much a, a different feeling of accomplishment when you take something off a pellet smoker compared to when you've tended to it for 14 hours in, in, uh, in, in, one, in, in one of those big bullet smokers. And what the other thing that I didn't mention on the podcast is it's just like, I think even in your business, Sometimes there's there's older ways of doing things. 
And then there's newer ways of doing things. So if you think of like an orthotic, doing a plaster cast. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like I used to make everything by hand myself until I got to about 90 pairs a month. And I was thinking, I can't keep making things, seeing patients and making 90 pairs of orthotics by hand a month. For sure. Yeah. Being very time consuming. So I had to find other ways. Mm -hmm. So the first way was send my orthotics off to a lab and have the lab mm -hmm. made. And then it was trying to find which lab was the best one. And not all labs were created equal. For sure. And then down the track, I eventually got my own milling. Yeah, you know, we started scanning and using a milling machine. So it was just it was, as things changed over time. And I think this equates back to the smoking as well, that you start off like having the bullet smoker is almost like a plaster cast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like doing everything by hand and it's very labor intensive. When you send it off to a lab, it's probably like a pellet smoker. It's, it's done for you. It comes back and you go, hmm, I've got the orthotic, but I wasn't really involved in the whole process. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it certainly can be like that for sure. Yeah. And if any of your listeners are interested, you know, looking at the differences in different kinds of casting modalities, we published some research a couple of years ago with a great team of people that looked specifically at the differences in what happens with the foot between using a foam box cast and a plaster cast. And uh, there were some really interesting, really interesting things that came out of that research. So um, if you're interested, take a look. You can find that on PubMed. And, uh, and uh, well, would you be able to send us a, a link to that? Sure, I can. Yeah, yeah, can no problem. That in the show notes. So if someone's listening yeah. to this, they can go to the show notes and and then actually have a read it. Because I reckon that'd be really interesting because you always have people talking about what's better, plaster cast, phone box, doing a scan. Um, yeah. Well, do you, do you want to dig into that for a couple of minutes? Or do yeah, you yeah, need to around? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd, so I'd, you there we go. So to, you know, to that end, we wanted to ask that question because we get it all the time too. And so, you know, there was a, a team of researchers at uh, the Wobble Lab at Western led by Tom Jenkins, who's, you know, uh, like a, a NASA PhD uh, in, in material science. And we use uh, biplanar fluoroscopy. So two matched up fluoroscopy units. So moving x-rays for those of you who don't know, and then every patient needed to get a CT scan. We were able to then take the bones of the foot in the CT scan, recreate a 3D model of the foot. And then on top of the, uh, the two fluoroscopy units, we were able to put that CT model and at 17 frames a second, move the CT model so that we could then measure the motion of the bones in real time in a shoe under different kinds of orthotic conditions. And what we found was that there were, there were no differences between people who had high arched feet and people who had you know, normal arched feet yeah. uh, between plaster and foam box when, when we made them an orthotic and the motion of the medial longitudinal arch. And actually for people who had significantly lower arched feet for that Pez planus group, that the foam box by one degree controlled the motion of the medial longitudinal arch better than the plaster casted ones did. And so you know, it was it was a, a small earth sample of people. I think I think that one was fourteen or sixteen people, because you can imagine that was it, was it was an incredibly time consuming project to be able to get all of that data um, and and work with it within the, the confines of a master's degree. And um, so there was a, a few pieces of research that came out of that. And so we looked at both what happened with the rear foot, the medial longitudinal arch between the two different kinds of casting mediums. But then we also compared that to hard orthotics, soft orthotics, and a, um, uh, an over-the-counter barefoot science orthotic in terms of how, how the, the motions of the foot changed. Yeah. And so, you know, it was at that time and still is one of the most scientifically accurate ways of measuring that. And so if someone wants to know, I mean, dogmatically, there's a lot of, a lot of people really want to hold on to them. Well, plaster is the best because it's the way we've always done it. But our research really does show that, you know, for certain types of people, maybe it's no different and perhaps it's not as good under certain kinds of conditions. Really, as any good, you know, technician is going to tell you, if you, you know, cast somebody in plaster or wax or foam, or you take a laser light scan of somebody's foot, it's what you do with that. You should be able to make an orthotic under all of those conditions that do the same thing to the person's foot in their shoe, if you know what you're doing with it. Oh, that's going to get people thinking. And just, you mentioned the barefoot science orthotics. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah, yeah. So on, on those, the, the, there, there was no systematic effects of, of movement or change in the arch because at the end of the day, that that's kind of not their deal. Okay. So what's your thinking on it? Um, 
I'll, I'll reserve comment. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I, I, <laughs> it should. I'll have to edit. I, I, I don't. I don't think that the mechanism the by which they say it yeah. works works the same way. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I, I don't think that you can just put something underneath someone's arch and, and have that strength and stuff. I think that there's, there needs to be more that happens, you know, there overall. Um, and so, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, uh, what works for you, if, it, if, if something works for you, then that's, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. When, when I, pre when I stop recording, I'll, um, cause I'll edit this part out of the podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be on the video because the video is uncut. So we, so yeah, it'll be fine. But when I press stop, okay. I'll get another question for you. Um, so anyway, so Colin, I want to thank you for coming on the Podiatry Legends podcast. And oh, one last thing before you go. Do you know <laughs> Kerry Fleming in Nova Scotia? Kerry Fleming in Nova Scotia. Um, she was man, on, the name sounds so she familiar. Was on episode 130. And, okay. Um, it was titled All That in a Bag of Chips. Oh, then that, that's probably why I recognize it from, from listening to the episode. Yeah, because she's a, she's a pathologist as well. Right, right. And she has a really, really good business over there. And I hadn't heard that saying before, all that in a bag of chips, which is why uh, I okay. that, that. So, but it was a, it was a really interesting uh, conversation. So, Colin, yeah, once again, I just want to thank you for coming on Podiatry Legends podcast, sharing your knowledge. And yeah, like I said, I'll leave a link to what you were just talking about then about the casting and, and phone boxes. I think people will find that interesting. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It was a fun, uh, fun conversation. No, this has been great. Thank you. All right.